My name is Allie. I'm one of these ministers here along with Nick Johnson. And I am married, um, not to Nick, to my husband Sam, and I have a son, Calvin. He's two years old. He's awesome. Um, and just a little bit about me, I attended Benedict College. I studied evangelization and catechesis. I also played volleyball there, and ever since college, I've been doing youth ministry, and I'm just very, very thankful to be here at St. Michael's. We have such a great parish, so many amazing things happening, and one of those things is our confirmation program and our high school life team program, so I'm very thankful to be a part of it. Um, I'm going to bring Nick up here and just as you come up with. Um, and we're just going to talk today just about all things confirmation, what kind of our story is what we're doing with confirmation, the requirements that we'll need to have in some of our parent meetings, which you're here, so thank you. We already had one parent meeting a few weeks ago where other parents attended, so thank you for being here today. And if anyone's watching virtually, thank you for being here. So next time you introduce yourself, I kind of get started. Thank you, Holly. Um, yeah, so I, a little bit about me, I grew up in Olathe. Um, we moved to Kansas City when I was about nine months old or so. So grew up in a Johnson County kid, uh, forever went to Prince of Peace growing up um, for all of my sacraments. Graduated from the South, went to K-State, studied landscape architecture, um, which makes a lot of sense that I'm now a youth minister, um, studies-wise. But really, God, God works in awesome ways um, through relationships that I formed at K-State, and I got into youth ministry um, actually at Prince of Peace, where I actually met Allie, I also knew her husband before, um, well, actually, not technically before you knew him, but I got to know Sam um, before they were dating and stuff like that. Um, and like Callie said, we're really, really close friends. Um, our our uh, couples um, get together on a regular basis, but um, the Lord just worked in awesome ways uh, and called me to St. Michael's about a year ago, just over a year ago. So I've been here for just over a year. Um, it's been amazing, obviously not the prototypical first year that I expected in youth ministry, but it's been awesome to see the Lord work um, through me and through the people around uh, around me here at St. Michael's. And it's such a blessing to have Father Brian here. And I'm just going to invite Father Brian up here to just open us up in prayer. I was thinking, okay, small crowd, I'm going to read me to talk. But you know what? We're live streaming and we're recording. So you're going to get the full thing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, send forth your Spirit to enkindle in our hearts the fire of your love. Give us a burning love for Jesus, a love that sends us forth to bear witness to our faith in the world, to be lights. Bless all these children preparing for confirmation. Open their hearts to be receptive to this great gift of your spirit. And bless their parents and help them be good role models of the faith. And bless our time here this afternoon that we offer for your glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. So, I um, just want to give everybody kind of a background. Um, some families have been here for a lot, and this is their second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth child that they've had go through confirmation. Some of you, it might be the first time. Um, so just a little bit about EDGE. EDGE encapsulates all of our junior high um, youth ministry. So all of our service, all of our walking with, um, all of our seventh and eighth graders is EDGE. So if, you're, if you have a child that's at uh, school here, um, they are part of EDGE. It's kind of this big, big umbrella of ministry to our middle school 7th and 8th graders. Um, part of that, part of the way that we serve is um, out of the reality that we are in today. So 79% of former Catholics will leave the church by the time they're 23. Of that 79% of them, 50% of that, so 40% of Catholics we can say, we know through studies, have left the church by the time they've left high school. So that's massive numbers. And in response to that, and in response to the way that the Holy Spirit, the Lord is moving through this church um, and this ministry, is we want to walk with these 
middle schoolers. And we want to partner with, with parents and with the parish um, to just surround our teens with as many mentors and as many people that are walking the way of being disciples of the Lord as we can. And by doing that, we believe that um, the Lord can work mightily. Um, and it's through this network of, of relations um, that the Lord is going to work. And, and part of that is through our edge program, um, our youth ministry, and to life in our high school youth ministry. Um, our core, like our mission statement, is leading teens closer to Christ through an authentic community that is rooted in the Eucharist. That's it. We're going to lead teens closer to Christ through our Lord in the Eucharist and through the sacraments. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So everything that we do is going to be focused around these core values of being authentic, missionary, and sacramental. We are going to be real. Allie and I, we train our core team, both our adults and our high school core team, um, to be authentic. Don't try to be somebody that you're not. Be who the Lord has made you to be and live that out fully because who you have been made to be is incredible. That's awesome. It's unique. It is you. We want, to, we want our teens to know that they are seen, loved, and heard. And we want them to be able to live that authentically. Second one, our core value is being missionary. We want to empower our teens to be missionary, to be able to live boldly. And we also do that by living that out and, and encouraging that we're going to go out. During the pandemic, one of, um, one of the, just the joys that we had was actually going to our teens' houses and just spending time with them, just saying hi. When we couldn't gather together at the end of lockdown, we just wanted to serve. Like, that's just one example of how we're going to go out and be missionary. And if it's difficult, if we have restrictions, we're going to continue to spread the good news just as though our Lord has called us to do. And finally, we're going to be sacramental. We're not going to be anything besides Catholic. Like, we are Catholic. We, we believe in the sacraments. We are going to walk that sacramental life of confession, of the Eucharist, through the gift of the, con of the sacrament of um, confirmation, through the, the gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out to go and live these four values full. Um, and then there's basically like four parts on like how we're going to do that. So we kind of heard the what and the why. This is the how. We have a core team. Our dream, like this year, we can't do things um, that we were planning on doing with our our, um, our in school students. But we are able to like instead of having a tour team, um, Allie and I are able to like spend time with all of our team in a small group. Granted, it's every third week, but we're able to develop those relationships. And it's through relational ministry that we believe that the Lord can work um, in awesome ways, like I said earlier. The second thing, like, we're going to have small groups. So it's in discussion. It's, that's how you develop those relationships is in discussion, having authentic, real conversations, being open to those questions um, to be able to, like, explore and expand our understanding. Finally, like, there is an important role in games, and we have games both um, in school and on our edge Wednesday nights. And I want to just reiterate that yes, like we we spend time with our eighth graders in school um, every week, every Tuesday morning, but they are always invited to to join us on Wednesday nights at edge. That is an open invitation that they can come and they can join us on Wednesday nights. We'll plug them into a small group. Um, that night, and they're all able to be able to just be incorporated right into that. Now, is it like we? Is it a requirement that they come every Wednesday? No, but that is an opportunity for them, our school, and as a church community, for us to gather together and build those relationships that kind of um, just enhance the ability to live out um, our core values. And in that, like we're going to play games, we're going to have fun. I'm not somebody that just wants to be serious and just be looked at as just this uptight type of person. That's just not me living authentically of who I am. I like to have fun, and we're going to have fun. And games break down walls. They, they, just, they, break, they make it easier to get to know people um, and have those shared experiences. And finally, like, we are going to partner with you. Like, that is one of the biggest things that I hope that we can take out of this um, time together today is that we are here to partner with you. Um, we are here to help you. 
If you guys have questions, if you guys have worries, we are here for you. We are here to not only serve your teams, but also to walk and serve you guys. Because we all know seventh and eighth graders are the easiest people to have conversations with. They're the most like logical, they are the most direct, they are the most vulnerable people. Like we get that, right? No. <laughs> no. They can be so challenging. And so we want you to know that we are here to support you, to partner with you. And so I'm going to have Ali come up and talk about just kind of the requirements, um, the nitty gritty, I would call it, of confirmation prep. Awesome. That's my favorite thing. Um, okay, so in your packet here, you have, or you have this in front of you, your schedule, all the requirements, the lives of all, there should be the lives of all the requirements on the back. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go through that just to um, just kind of give you a background of why you have all this stuff. So Nick talked about EDGE. This is actually our schedule for EDGE. If your students is, attend virtually or if they attend uh, St. Michael's school, the schedule is still important. Like Nick said, we, you are, your students are always invited to come to EDGE no matter what school they go to or even what church they go to. We had teenagers that loved EDGE so much last year that they invited their friends from school and they weren't even Catholic. So that's where we dive into that. Um, core value of being missionary. So it doesn't matter where you go to school, what church you attend, you're invited to come to EDGE. So this schedule is important to you. Also, what's highlighted in red is things that um, you are really encouraged and required to attend, or those are the due dates. So you'll see parent nights on there, sponsor nights on there, and then when all of the requirements are due. And they're due the same dates regardless of how you attend confirmation formation. So if you have school, virtual, or edge, the, the requirements are due on that day. Um, so I just want to go through kind of what all the requirements are and why, so it makes sense. Because you're probably going to get that question from your student, why do I have to do this? Well, here's your, here's your answer, and here's what you can say to them. So a sponsor, why do we need a sponsor? It kind of dives into that idea of why we need relational ministry. We need people that are going to walk with us in our faith. We need people that are going to challenge us. We need people that we can look up to that are holy and that are people that we want to be like. So for a confirmation sponsor, some things that you need to know is you can only have one confirmation sponsor. Only one. You can't have your two uh, brothers and sisters, but you can only have one confirmation sponsor. The sponsor has to be Catholic. They have to be a practicing Catholic. So they go to Mass every Sunday. They have a prayer life. They're devoted to the Eucharist. They, they live the Catholic life. Um, they also need to be 16 years or older. So they need to be confirmed in 16 years or older. And we don't want this to just be, I don't know, they could be your aunt or uncle or grandma. Yes, absolutely. But these need to be someone that knows your teenager well, someone that is going to be a life be a lifelong relationship for them. So this person needs to take this responsibility seriously that their job is to get your child to heaven. Um, I just met with a girl yesterday and she asked me to be a confirmation sponsor and she, she was going to be awesome. She's like, I want to meet with you at least monthly. I need you to challenge me in my faith. I want you to teach me how to read scripture. I want us to pray together. I want you to come to my soccer games because I want you to be a part of my life. That's kind of the idea of what a confirmation sponsor should be. The confirmation sponsor also needs to attend. Um, we had a sponsor night just this past Wednesday, so if your child sponsor wasn't able to come, we also recorded it so they could have that conversation afterwards. But we also have one um, in January, I believe, that it's on here and highlighted. Um, sponsor night. I'm sorry, I should have that. Thank you. January 20th. Um, so that's when the sponsor is, is for the next one, January 20th. The other thing your child will need to choose is a patron saint. Your patron saint is someone that is going to pray for you, someone that your child would look up to, someone that your child um, maybe has something in common with. It's something that also, too, they take on their name, and we see that a lot in scripture from Simon changing his name to Peter. Whenever he had a name change, it was a mission change. And that's much like for your children. 
as they're becoming confirmed, they have a new change in mission. Now they're called to go out just like the apostles at Pentecost. So they have a new change in mission. The, the next thing is, if you're an eighth grader, um, they will be writing a letter to the archbishop. And this is important because for confirmation, you need to have a desire for confirmation. It doesn't matter what I want or Nick wants or what Father Brian wants or even what you want. The teenagers need to have a desire for this for this sacrament. And so when they're writing a letter to Archbishop now, then this shows their desire to be confirmed. And this letter is really important that they write it themselves, that they share why they want to be confirmed, what they've done to prepare for confirmation, how they've prayed and even served to get ready for confirmation. Um, and that goes into service. So when we when we serve, this shows that we love other people. That was the gospel message today. When we're serving, we can show our love for other people. We can show that we're a disciple of Christ. And it can help us prepare um, for confirmation. This year is going to look a little bit different because we can't say you need to get this amount of hours because there's really not that many places that are opening their doors for just 14-year-olds to come in and serve. So we're just asking you to create a to create a service project each semester for just your child to do. And that can be something as simple as maybe writing letters to someone that's in an elderly home. Maybe that's donating food or cleaning out their closet. So being creative with things that you can do from your home or at a distance to keep our community safe. So you're coming up with a project each semester and they will just write about it. And so that goes into where do we turn these in? You can go to stmichaelcp.org. And this is written on every single page of your handout. It's stmichaelcp.org slash confirmation. And that is where you will turn everything in. And if you're a school student, Ms. McAtee might have a different plan for you. You might hand them physically in. Um, so she'll get those to us. But they're due on the exact same days. But if you have any questions about confirmation, what the requirements are, even the whys behind all of these things, you can find them at stmichaelcp.org slash confirmation, and that's where you'll turn everything in, see all the due dates, the schedules, the why. Even on there, we have um, a template for the letter to Archbishop, so they don't even have to create their own letter, just kind of fill in the questions that we ask for them. Um, Nick kind of talked about this a little bit, but we want to truly partner with you. We want to be on your team. I know I said this to Father Brian a few weeks ago, but I will on Sunday in Calvin, and there are hundreds of mothers of young children's groups that I could attend and get support for raising my kid. That's two. But as your child gets older, and even now, it seems like there's more complicated questions that you might have, and there's very little support. There's no mothers of teenagers groups, mothers of 7th and 8th graders groups. So we want to offer that support for you. And how we want to do that is we want to encourage you to come to three parent nights. And these nights are November 11th, February 10th, and March 31st. And on these nights, your student can attend EDGE. If they're going to EDGE, they need to be there. If they're a school student, we would love for them to be there. But it's a separate night for you as a parent. You're going to hear speakers that are going to come talk to you maybe about theology of the body or just have, um, have conversations with your students. There will be nights that you can have conversations with other parents and get support from them as well. So this is a night to really just for you, for your formation, to help you in your spiritual life, to help you in your family life. So November 11th, February 10th, and March 31st. And those will be from 7 to 8.30. Um, the last thing I want to share with you is um, our eighth graders have to attend a retreat before confirmation, and we have two options for them. One is our Into the Deep retreat, and it's December 4th through 6th, and this weekend is a powerful weekend. Many of our students that are in high school that are now attending live team regularly, this weekend was the moment that changed their life that helped them encounter Christ, that brought them into a community. So this weekend was crucial for them. And now they're willing to come back and serve on this weekend because it was so important to them. So December 4th and the 6th. And I know that there's probably a lot of questions about COVID and how are you going to keep my team safe. I don't have all of those answers just yet. You'll be getting those that information 
in this coming week, we're going to open up registration. So you'll get all of those emailed to you. It'll be on our website. We know that we're just working hard to make this a safe retreat for your students, make sure social distancing is offered. We'll be wearing masks. Um, we'll keep it safe, but also still an opportunity for teenagers to have fun and encounter the Lord. If they can't attend this retreat, we have another option, and that's January 18th from 4 to 7, or 4 to 9, I'm sorry. We bring in uh, NET, their national ret um, retreat evangelization, and they'll come and give a retreat on November, January 18th from 4 to 9. But please, please, please sign up for Into the Deep. It's incredible. Um, I want to say it's better than the Net Retreat. Can I say that? Oh, okay. It's better than the Net Retreat. <laughs> it's way better than the Net Retreat. So that's all I have. Um, Father Ryan's going to come up here. And then, yeah. Well, congratulations having the student for confirmation, and I feel so blessed with Nick and Allie as our youth ministers. I want to provide you some resources. If you have not downloaded form at home, please do that. That opens up a whole library of resources. So how do you download form? Number one, go to the St. Michael website and just search for form. It'll come up. And what you do is you put in your name and your email, and you will receive an email with a code. And then on your smart TV, you just go to add a channel, search for form, and download form, and it's going to ask you for the code that's emailed to you, and you have form. You can download it on your TV, your tablet, your phone. And this opens up a whole library of resources, movies, videos, Awesome. The one thing on form I would highly recommend is a series called The Search. Seven episodes, they're about 25 minutes each. Watch those with, I think the junior high kids can watch those. I mean, I, I was recommended The Search by a young person, and so I watched them. I thought, wow, it's appealing for young people to adults. Okay? A couple other books that I would recommend as resources. The Collapse of Parenting by Leonard Sachs. The Collapse of Parenting by Leonard Sachs. And this book called Disconnected by Thomas Kirstein. It's about how, surprisingly, we think, wow, we're more connected than ever, but we're actually increasingly isolated and disconnected. Uh, excellent book about technology today. Okay, well, Nick and Ali began by kind of giving us this sobering statistic that about 80% of people who leave the church do so by the time they're 23. Well, along with that, the fastest growing segment in American culture are what we call the nuns. Those when asked, what is your faith? They say, I don't believe anything. I don't have anything. In fact, there are now more nuns in America than Catholics. So the fastest growing segment. Sherry Waddell, in her book, Forming Intentional Disciples, says nationally, 11% of millennials are going to church. 11% of millennials. And so the theme of her book is cultural Catholicism is dead. What does she mean by that? That it used to be you grew up in kind of a Catholic neighborhood and parish, and culturally, our Christian values were supported. And so you were supported in being a Christian, a Catholic, in our society. But we're growing up in an increasingly secular society that's bombarding us with things that lead us away from the church. We don't have that support to really live our Christian faith and stay connected to the church. And so one mind shift we have to make, especially through these uh, years, K through 12, we've got to move away from, okay, it's enough that I'm 
preparing my children to receive the sacrament. We see this especially in religious said that in sacramental years, like first and second grade, okay, our numbers are up because they're going to receive communion. Seventh and eighth grade, our numbers are up because they're going to receive confirmation. And there's this mindset, I've done my job, that I prepared my children and they've received their sacraments. We have to move away from that notion that our faith is just about, I've done my job, they've received the sacraments. And we have to move to, we are forming lifelong disciples. All of religious ed and our school religion is about forming lifelong disciples. Now the sacramental years are important moments in discipleship, but it's not the end of anything. Okay. So often people say, okay, my kids confirm, now they're done with their religion. No, that's only the beginning. We can you imagine if in anything else we were satisfied with an eighth grade understanding of anything? No. Confirmation is just the beginning of this lifelong journey as a disciple. Okay. Sherry Waddell's point then in forming intentional disciples, because culturally we're not supported in living our Catholic faith, we have to be more intentional about forming a Christian home. And now more than ever, what we call the domestic church is important. What is the domestic church? It's our family. And so that's where I want to begin today. How can we really be more intentional about living our faith at home? Because it's staggering how many families really don't pray together or talk about their faith together. And we still have the mentality like, okay, well, I know we'll get that in school or don't get that in the set. No, we got to be intentional about living that at home. So, number one. Well, do we have a driver? Okay. Number one. Create positive contact with the church. Create positive contact. And along with this, I would say positive family ritual. So, Sherry says that the first step of evangelization is building trust. Dr. Greg and Lisa Popchek are national speakers. They have a radio show. They've written tons of books. They say that children who have a warm and positive experience of church growing up as children are much more likely to practice their faith as adults. So, develop good family rituals around church. For instance, growing up, Sunday morning, our ritual was we would go to 8 a.m. Mass at Holy Rosary Via City. You know, my family moved to 159th and Illinois in 1977. 10 mile drive out to Via. We'd go to 8 a.m. Mass, and then Sunday morning was always when we would come home and cook breakfast together as a family. Now, recently, at my parents' 55th wedding anniversary dinner, I, we were reminiscing and said, Dad, I always loved that sausage that you made at the Sunday breakfast. What, what was that? What kind of sausage was it? <laughs> you know, this is, I just found this out like a month ago. He said, oh, that wasn't sausage. It was fried bologna. <laughs> <laughs> so I was eating fried bologna with eggs as a kid. You know? I love it. <laughs> okay. Positive family rituals. Um, experiences. I know at the fish fries, I love to just go around to the tables, and there's this one family where these little kids, this little boy, his parents say his favorite thing of the entire year is the fish fries. He looks forward to them all year long, and one fish fry is like, oh my gosh, he's not here. What happened to your son? He said he got in trouble 
and he wasn't able to come. And the fish fry this week, and they're like, oh my gosh, what a penalty that kept us for our tails all year long, that he wasn't allowed to come to the fish fry. Those are examples of positive experiences. Think about your own family growing up. I remember like going to the stations of the cross, going to the fish fries, all of the culture of Catholicism, those just positive experiences growing up. Second, we have to be more intentional about witnessing to our children, witnessing our faith. So actually talking about Jesus to our children and who Christ is to us in our lives and what my faith in Jesus has meant to me and that Jesus is somebody that I have a relationship with. And we naturally talk about people who are important to us. Well, do we talk about Jesus with our kids? Some of my favorite family memories are when of an evening we would just turn off the TV and talk about our faith. I remember doing that. And uh, talking about something of real substance about our faith. Number three, be involved in their catechesis. So don't just pass the buck. You know, find out what they're learning in school of, in their religion class and confirmation and, and be involved in it. Ask questions. I think there's something called like discussion, family discussion questions along with the coursework. This is a way that you can open conversation with your children. Okay, and I don't have these in any specific order. Pray at home. Okay, and some people, when they hear praying at home, they say, oh yeah, we do that. And so, okay, what do you do? Well, we say a prayer before we eat there. Okay, that's important, but it's got to be more than that. Uh, more substantial prayer at home. One of the things I really find edifying is how the family grocery is really growing. And people are tuning into Mike Scherzlitz's uh, rosary. He has 10,000 people following his daily rosary podcast. Um, and that's really growing. Beautiful. One thing we did at home during Lent was we prayed the rosary together. Um, also, we prayed the rosary as a family in the car. And whenever we were going anywhere over 15 minutes, and the four of us kids would start fighting, uh, you know, you're going my side of the car, the other one, and my mom would say, okay, we're praying the rosary. And so we pray the rosary in the car all the time. And it's beautiful because still today, like, my parents are from Northwest Missouri, and so when we go up home to visit relatives, we have an hour and a half, two hour drive, and still today we pray the rosary together on the way up to visit our relatives. And that's just something that is natural because my parents uh, set that for us. Uh, to pray together. Okay, live the liturgy at home. Live the liturgy at home. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, celebrate the seasons of the year, the liturgical year of your home. So it's Advent. We're going to have an Advent wreath. We're going to have an Advent calendar. I remember that growing up. Now, as kids, we always fought about who got to light the candles, and we would blame the candle wax and start little fires. And <laughs> I'm surprised my mom didn't just say enough of this. But it was a way that we celebrated those rituals again at home and incorporated the liturgical season at home. I remember opening the Advent calendar and um, having a little Bible reading before dinner during Advent. We did things together as a family for Lent, so we had a common penance for Lent. All the kids at home, we never ate candy during Lent, but it was something we did together. Uh, we prayed the rosary, we went to the Stations of the Cross, we went to the fish fries. Um, of course, you celebrate the feasts at home, Christmas and Easter, but think about it, like, wow, culturally, we want to celebrate these seasons of our life as Christians in our homes. Okay. Of course, attending Mass. 
has to be something we do as a family. I mean, kids will see immediately the seriousness with which you take your faith by your own practice of the faith. So living a sacramental life would be a better uh, word for that. Because not only mass, but also like going to confession. Like your kids need to see you go to confession and go with them. You know, it's not enough to just say, we well, yeah, have to go to the kids. I'll have quarterly confession at school where they have the admins and make confessions in our heat. But kids need to see their parents going. Again, growing up, you know, we had this 10 mile drive out to Wea. And on our drive out there, my mom would usually help us examine our conscience for confession. So she would say, okay, remember, don't forget you disobeyed me and you fought with your siblings. We always had plenty of ammo for the confessional by the time we arrived at a church. Our parents, we would review our, our an examination of conscience on the way out the church. Okay, attending this. You know, I, I'm always a little bit shocked when um, parents don't make their kids go to Mass. You know, I'll see parents and they're like, oh, where's your high school? Or, oh, you know. Okay, I can't imagine growing up telling my parents, um, I'm not going to go to church this Sunday. I think they would have said, what are you talking about? Get in the car. You know, it just, something's got to change that we have, I think it's got to happen. Maybe that's a culmination of something that hasn't been lived um, intensely, and then they get in high school. Um, here's a study that you can Google the effect of fathers not going to church. Because I've had this experience where a mom will come in and say, I can't get my teenage son or daughter to go to Mass. I said, Well, tell me about your family. What's that mean? She said, Oh, well, my, my husband's not Catholic and he doesn't get up in the morning on Sunday. And so now my teenager's like, well, dad doesn't have to go, I don't have to go. And it's so important to be united as a couple and in your parenting. Not that, okay, if your spouse is a Catholic, they gotta convert, but just the fact that they're willing to go and support raising the kids in the faith, that's so huge. And Kids, most often, this study says, look to their father as an example of faith and will most often follow the faith practice of the father. Why is that? I try to think, why do kids naturally look to their father as an example of faith? Well, as Christians, we teach our kids, God is our father. And so little kids begin to... Uh, the image of God they have is their own father. And so when they see their father praying, going to confession, going to church, that is a huge impact. And so parents uh, live it together and come to church together as a family. Okay, it's a battle worth having if uh, our kids aren't going to mass with a challenge. Okay, Allie already mentioned um, We've got to evangelize our kids, and a beautiful way to do that is retreats. So take advantage of the retreats and uh, conferences that we offer here, the Skin to the Deep retreat, and then as our eighth graders are graduating, sign them up to go on the summer student build trip. This is huge. Um, it's a great conference weekend where kids really have an experience of Jesus on that trip. One of my favorite parts of the trip is just on the, on the bus ride home, they'll have an opportunity to share a grace they experienced on the weekend. And I've heard more than one kid say, wow, for the first time, I realized Jesus is really present in the Eucharist. And these are kids that go to homes all the time. But they have that breakthrough moment where God really opened their heart. Okay. Um, just a few things from this book very briefly. The premise of the Collapse of Parenting book is this, that kids today are more influenced by their peers than their parents. Kids today are looking more to their peers than their parents. How do we um, 
have influence over our kids. These are basic things that Dr. Sachs says work. Having family dinner together, actually having a meal together, and turning off the TV during family dinners. You know, 67% of families watch TV during dinner. That's from the book Disconnected. Schedule family vacations with just family. What happens if your kids bring their friends on your family vacation? It's bonding time with their peers rather than bonding time with parents. So that's another thing, is family vacations with just family. Doing fun things with your kids to form deeper bonds with your children. I can remember Sunday afternoons growing up was often a fun family time. We would go bowling or go to a movie. We did fun things together with our parents. Okay, being parents to your children instead of trying to be their best friend. I'll never forget this experience I had once at a youth group setting where we were eating lunch and these two girls were at the table in high school and they were talking about their weekend. And one of them was like, what did you do this weekend? I said, oh, I got to go to this party. And the other girl said, oh, I had to stay home. My parents were going to go out. And I'll never, I was so shocked when the girl that went to the party said, well, at least your parents care what you do. My parents never cared about it. That was a real moment, like, wow. Um, to really, kids want their parents to be parents to set structure and limit in their life. Um, and to really love them, it means sometimes saying no to them. Also, being involved in their use of technology. Okay, there's another book called I Generation, which I actually listened on audio books. It says that there is a direct correlation with middle school kids' use of social media and the increase of anxiety and depression among our kids. Because what they're doing, they're worrying about what their friends are saying and doing, and it's, it's all this fear of missing out, and it's raising their anxiety. Why was I invited? I'm seeing this party going on in real time and I'm here at home alone. And so we've got to limit our kids' use of technology. Now in this book, Thomas Kirsty, he says, the number one question that he gets from parents is, what age should I give my child a smartphone? Now, this is his response in the book. He says, I respond by saying, at what age are you comfortable with your child looking at pornography? Because that's what's going to happen. Okay, so we do have to question, okay, is it prudent to give unrestricted access to the internet to our kids? I mean, naturally, we think about our own uh, uh, sexual development. You know, we go through a curiosity phase when we're young kids. And so I remember growing up, I mean, this isn't confessional, but Okay, as little kids, we would like look at the Sears catalog to see women in the bras. Okay, well now, third, fourth, fifth graders who are going through this curiosity, they, if they have unrestricted access to the internet, they're seeing terrible things. Okay, now we want to have transparency in our use of the internet. We want to have the parental controls, the accountability. But even if we have all that in place, the filtering, the accountability, all that, they say the number one thing that keeps kids away from pornography is communication with their parents. We've got to talk to our kids about these things. That's why now we're giving second grade parents a book called Good Picture, Bad Picture, where they begin to share with their kids. There's bad things on the internet, and if you see them, you want to have a culture of trust in your home where your kids can come to talk to you about it. And they can tell you that they saw something inappropriate because the studies are saying now it's not a matter of if, but when your child will be exposed to this on the internet, often in the normal course of doing homework. We've got to get a control on the internet. No TVs, phones in the bedrooms. This is a real epidemic problem. 
Okay, so that's my little spiel about evangelizing our kids and parenting. And now I just want to do a quick overview, a refresher for you on the sacrament of confirmation. Okay. In confirmation, we receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is a post-baptismal reception of the Spirit. So we receive the Holy Spirit in our baptism, and we receive again a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our confirmation. So we see this in the Bible. After Jesus was baptized, after his baptism, remember, the Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove. We also have reference of this in other scriptures. For instance, Acts chapter 19, Hebrews chapter 6, Acts chapter 8, where we see that baptized people, the apostles came, and it was through the laying on of hands that they received again this post baptismal outpouring of the Spirit. Now, there's a difference in the East and the West in the reception of confirmation. In the Eastern Catholic Church, in, e in Eastern Orthodox churches, confirmation is administered immediately after baptism. So that's why sometimes we hear baptism referred as um, being chrismated or um, so after baptism, they would be anointed with the oil of chrism and receive confirmation as an infant. Okay, in the Western Church, the sacrament has been reserved to the bishop. Well, the archbishop can't travel around every Sunday to every church's baptism to be there to give confirmation. So the bishop sets an age at which he will come to your parish and administer the sacrament to all the baptized. So in our diocese, it's eighth grade. Now, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, and at the time, they were trying to move confirmation closer to baptism, so I was confirmed in second grade in Kansas City, Missouri. Anybody else confirmed early on? Yes. So in our diocese, it's eighth grade. What's going to happen in the night of confirmation? Okay, how do we receive this gift of the Spirit? So first, we receive the Spirit through the biblical gesture of the laying one of hands. So the bishop is going to lay hands over the whole group to be confirmed, confirmed, and he's going to call down the Holy Spirit upon them. And if you listen to that prayer, he's going to mention the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that they will receive. And then each person to be confirmed will come up individually with their sponsor, and the bishop will anoint their forehead with the oil of chrism, as he says the words, being sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's through that anointing with the oil of chrism that they will receive the indrushing of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Because we know there's only one God who's revealed himself as a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Father's God, the Son's God, the Holy Spirit's God, and yet there's only one God. And we can, it's easier for us, I think, to have an image of God as our Father, and we can imagine God as the Son, as Jesus, we, we can picture Jesus. But the Holy Spirit's a lot harder for us to get our minds around, our hearts around. So I just think the biblical images of the Holy Spirit kind of shed light on the Holy Spirit. So first, the Holy Spirit appeared to the apostles in tongues of fire at Pentecost. So 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire on the apostles. So think of that image of fire. It's the Holy Spirit that is this burning love of God that's going to set our hearts on fire for Jesus. And so after they received the gift of the Spirit, they couldn't contain themselves. You know, they were hiding out in fear that, oh, they were discovered and they were getting into their death like Jesus. And now they have this boldness and fortitude and courage. And they burst out of the upper room boldly proclaiming the gospel, witnessing to Jesus. So the fire, you say, wow. I want my kid to be set on fire. 
Uh, that's going to happen through confirmation, we pray. Okay, and now what happened when they began proclaiming the gospel? The Acts of the Apostles said many believed, and they said, what are we to do? And Peter says, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. But many, their hearts were hardened, and they didn't believe, and they began persecuting the apostles. So the apostles were imprisoned and beaten, and all of them at John were eventually martyred. Okay, but the Holy Spirit, another symbol was the dove, a symbol of peace. So it's the Holy Spirit that gives us this inner peace. So no matter what's happening in our life, we can be at peace, and that comes from God's indwelling presence. So we can go through suffering, persecution, and yet be at peace, no matter what is happening to us. I mean, think about the ocean on a stormy day where the waves can get up to like 40 feet. But if you go 500 feet below the surface, it's totally still. So in our lives, we can be going through turmoil, chaos, and yet we can have that gift of peace, the gift of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus also said the Spirit is our advocate, our paraclete. So the Holy Spirit guides our path. Lights are way. If we're trying to make a big decision, we call on the Holy Spirit to help us discern. Show me your will. Show me the way. Okay. Our Holy Spirit is our guide. We try to get the kids to think about it. Okay. Do you know the Holy Spirit is trying to inspire us and move us all the time? And so the Holy Spirit can inspire thoughts, feelings, and desires. So, have you ever had that where this thought pops in my mind like, oh, that I should pray right now? Okay, what's our second thought? I'm like, you know, I'll do that. Okay, I can do that, I can do that. And then I fall asleep. See, the key is to act quickly on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Or a longing or desire in our heart. I remember in my own discernment as a priest, I remember going to Mass as a single person, and this thought would come to me like, well, you know, I wonder if I can be a clear doing that, being a priest. Well, okay, inspiration from the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is inspiring us. So are we attentive? Are we listening? Which goes back to the technology, by the way. If we constantly distract ourselves, we are not as able to be receptive and listen. Okay, in fact, in this book, he, this guy is a counselor, and he told this teenager to do an exercise. He says, I want you to spend 15 minutes on your social media and then journal about your experience, and then just take 15 minutes where you're disconnected. Unplug everything and just spend 15 minutes in silence, and then journal about your experience. And this girl comes back and she says, well, I tried it, and when I did, was on my social media, I felt normal and good and happy. But that time that I tried to disconnect everything and just have silence for 15 minutes, I started feeling panicked and anxious. See, if, if we are addicted to our technology and can't even enter into silence, how are we ever going to hear God's voice? Okay, the Holy Spirit then is the love between the Father and the Son. Now, the Catechism says, Confirmation gives us the special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses to Christ, to, bear, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never be ashamed of the cross. So, through confirmation, our soul is stamped with a sacramental character. So certain sacraments mark our soul. When we're baptized, our soul is marked as a Christian. And similarly, in confirmation, our soul is marked as a confirmed Christian. And that can never be removed. Okay, the other sacrament that marks our soul is the sacrament of holy orders. That my soul is marked as a priest. Okay, 
Now, final notes. In preparation for confirmation, we're going to ask our kids and parents to do a novena together. Do you know the origins of the novena? So after Jesus rose from the dead, 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus is sent to heaven. And the apostles and Mary gathered in the upper room, and they prayed for nine days. And at the conclusion of those nine days, on the tenth day, 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit came down in tongues of fire. So the church is always about that nine days of prayer must be a sanctified time. And so that's the origin of a novena, nine days of prayer. So nine days before confirmation, we're going to do together a novena to the Holy Spirit. And then on the 10th day, on confirmation day, your children will receive the offering of the Holy Spirit. Okay, another way that they're going to prepare for this sacrament is to do their service projects. The catechism asks us to prepare for the sacrament confirmation by going to confession. So sin blocks our receptivity to grace. So if I would be totally open to receiving the grace of confirmation and the outcome of the Spirit, I want to go to confession to open my soul to God's presence. Finally, I would conclude with this. I want our kids to cultivate a relationship with Mary because she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, okay? And if we stay close to our mother, and if we do have that devotion to the rosary, Mary is going to guide us. She knows the Holy Spirit's will. And, and I know in my own vocational journey, I found my vocation through my devotion to Mary, in fact, if you know my story, I was in the seminary for five years and I left and I canceled my ordination and went back to work. And it wasn't until I did a total consecration to Jesus through Mary that I had this experience where I knew I was called to be a priest. When I put my life in Mary's hands as Jesus did, I received that grace of knowing my vocation. So cultivate a devotion to Mary because she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Okay, any questions that anyone has? I'm so excited. Nick and Allie have planned these um, parent nights. The next one is November 11th, and it's going to cover knowing our story. Do we know our story as Christians? Okay, do we know the good news?